So why do Warhammer 40k kits cost what they do? Let's take a rough look at Games Workshop's pricing strategy and a fair few examples of Warhammer kits and how much they'll set you back. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought we'd take a video to delve into Games Workshop's pricing model. Definitely a topic that comes up really quite a lot in discussion, given that Warhammer's got a reputation for being expensive. Perhaps particularly apparent when you talk to someone who's not in the hobby and show them something like a Space Marine Captain or a Forge World Primarch and tell them exactly how much money it would cost. Definitely from the outside of looking in, I feel like a lot of people are generally surprised at just how expensive model soldiers can get. In this video I thought we'd talk about why Games Workshop charge what they do and talk through infantry tanks and characters in the 40k range and why some of them cost a bit more than each other's and a few other strategies that Games Workshop seems to have going on in the background. First up, and I think perhaps the most simple answer for why Games Workshop charge what they do for Warhammer miniatures, is that the prices that they charge are prices that people in general are prepared to pay. As if people in general weren't prepared to pay these, then Games Workshop just wouldn't sell any kits, and they'd make a lot less money, even if the amount that they charge for each individual kit made them a bit more. I think in general people maybe overthink Warhammer pricing a little bit. Games Workshop's a publicly traded company, and wants to make as much profit and revenue for its shareholders as possible. So in general their incentive is, to, on an individual kit level, to charge as much as they can for those kits, up to the point where people start to buy less of them, and try and find the equilibrium point where people are prepared to pay for the models. You might have lost a few sales due to the high prices, but not so much that you start to go into negative returns. After that, everything also has to be balanced against the wider appeal of making the hobby playable for newer players, and not so expensive that it's just completely unattractive for anyone to get into. Perhaps a bit of a trade-off between long-term growth versus short-term profits. I'd say in general they tend to have a bit of a different strategy compared with their discount kits compared with their core range. The core range being a bit more expensive, but the discount kits maybe being a bit more tempting so there's an easy entry point to newer hobbyists. I have said in the past that I think the Games Workshop can afford to operate somewhat similarly to a monopoly over their own war game. Warhammer 40k and their other game modes seem to be by far the most commonly played tabletop miniature game the world over. Lots of alternative war games do exist, but nothing is anywhere near the size of Games Workshop operating brick and mortar shops in a whole load of major cities. That definitely gives them a lot more scope for basically charging kind of what they like, as they don't really have much direct competition for their 40k miniatures. You will get certain companies making lookalike sculpts and people 3D printing near proxies, but it doesn't really seem to harm them too much with their dominance in recent years. It seems at least for the moment, Warhammer in general still seems to be going through a big growth period from 8th edition onwards, and definitely doesn't look like Games Workshop as a company is going downhill anytime soon. Feeding into that, they've also got a massive amount of love for the lore and setting, with lots of people having been invested in the galaxy of the 41st millennium for literally decades at this point, plus lots of new blood coming in all the time. There are just a lot of tabletop hobbyists out there who just consider them 40k hobbyists who don't really jump between systems. Lack of competition definitely means that they can set prices more or less where they'd like and what people will be prepared to pay to participate in the hobby via the normal route at least. And I'd certainly argue that the prices that they charge for the plastic kits probably aren't really directly related to costs to produce the individual boxes. They often get people discussing the amount that it might take to print and ship the cardboard and the plastic sprues which could be really quite cheap indeed. I'm sure in terms of raw materials to how much they sell them for, they'll make a ridiculous profit on each one. The exact amount known only to them, I suppose. Another thing that maybe implies that the profits aren't really related to cost is when you get some things that have around about two or three times the plastic and sprues in for units that are then charged at exactly the same price as things that they sell far cheaper. And when they have massive discount deals that they still make a tidy profit on, like the Leviathan box set, far more miniatures for the cost or other discount runs like the Warhammer Conquest or Imperium magazine. I think that implies that they could charge a lot less for their core range and still do fine, but they just choose not to. Obviously that's not to say that Games Workshop don't have big outgoings for getting the kits to people. The cost of the plastic injection moulds is often rumoured to be at least reasonably high, though I've seen people claiming very different things as to how much it would likely cost them. But it does seem that every single type of new miniature that they bring to market, they're going to have at least a fair bit of initial outlay in terms of investment in designing it, sculpting it, making the mould, painting up showcase things and then advertising them to us. It would be kind of interesting to know if there were certain units that they've actually made losses on after all that. And then after all that's done, I'd guess that beyond that, probably the majority of the costs are not necessarily made up in raw materials. Probably more things like shipping, warehouse and logistics type cost, which is probably quite a big issue with a thousand plus products that they can try and attempt to keep in stock and often fail. 
Customer service must generally eat in a little bit as well. They generally do have a low threshold for shipping out new miniatures if there's an issue with yours. Then operating all their brick and mortar stores and staffing those with people through the week. Plus all the company's central costs like legal things, website operations and stuff like that. I'm not entirely sure what those kind of numbers would add up to versus the box of an individual Warhammer miniature set. But I guess that would be the actual price calculation you need to do as to whether or not Games Workshop makes a kit viably and how much they make on each box set. It does at least seem that they probably look over all their new launches and ranges to see what sort of return on investment they're getting from them. And particularly with the recent Space Marine things being pulled, it still now looks like they keep a very beady eye on their older range to see whether or not they're still viable, or whether the cost of keeping the model in their stock is probably harming them more than helping them, as they seem to have made the choice with things like, say, the Space Marine Hunter or Stalker, or the Death Watch Captain Artemis. Both of these fairly recent plastic kits, but seem to be so niche that they've decided to withdraw them from sale already, even though there's lots and lots of older Firstborn kits that still remain in the range. Overall though I'd consider that the main explanation behind why Warhammer kits are priced what they are, likely very small relation to the actual raw materials cost of going into any model soldier box set, but more charged based on the value to the hobbyist and what they think people are prepared to pay for the core miniatures that they come out with, and having a massive amount of people hugely invested in the setting and wanting to keep on going with the tabletop game, that combination means that they can charge really quite a lot, the bigger expenses being their shipping and distribution and central costs. That's only around about half the story though, as I think it's kind of interesting to delve into their individual box sets and what they charge for those as well. GW has a whole load of different price points and miniatures that are better or worse value, and there's definitely some themes that go on within them. First thing I'd say about Games Workshop's miniature range is that there's a bit of a split in the range to start with. Things that they consider either introductory deals or discount offers like starter sets or combat patrol boxes versus their actual core range of miniatures tending to more be the multi-part plastic kits, say a standard box of Space Marines or a Vindicator tank or something like that. They really are priced quite differently, and sometimes the contrast can be kind of funny. Say for example in 9th edition when some countries had the Recruit box set, which contains Necron Warriors versus some Space Marine Assault Intercessors, that was actually priced less than the individual box of Necron Warriors that came without all the Space Marines. It looked like an absolutely stupid deal to the casual observer, as most people wouldn't ever buy the Necron Warriors, but it was just the difference between the core range offering and the discount deal, and the discounts tend to come and go. Now we don't have the 9th edition starter sets anymore, so only the more expensive Warrior box remains. I feel like Games Workshop's strategy with the introductory or discount sets is to maybe have a cheaper route to get people into Warhammer 40k, one that you don't necessarily need to expand anymore if you're on a really tight budget, it also could be the way to get people interested in playing the game for a bit cheaper than you would otherwise be able to. And then after that they might turn into people who are gradually adding more units to their army over time. Things that might be a lot less of a good deal in terms of money per models compared with the starter sets that they began with. In general if you do want to play Warhammer with Games Workshop miniatures, I'd argue that if you go for the absolute best deals it's not all that expensive. Say for example pick up one half of Leviathan second hand, that gives you almost a thousand points worth of miniatures on the table and is really quite an easy start. Or you could go for the combat patrol boxes at £95, €125 Euros, or dollars usually around a quarter of a 2000 point force, but you can just play them with their own box set. A pretty easy way to have a mini Warhammer 40k army that's playable right from the get go. Still obviously a fair bit of money on an individual level, but in theory that provides you entertainment for a fair amount of time, what with building and painting it up. As mentioned, the minis do seem kind of expensive for the raw materials that you're getting for that cost, though you could probably justify it as being not so very different from, say, regularly going to the cinema or buying fairly expensive video games with some regularity. And at least in theory, with Warhammer 40k, the miniatures do hold their value a bit. You could always sell afterwards if you'd like. I think they're fairly sensibly committed to keeping entry points really quite cheap for people. For example, in 9th edition, when they had their last price rise set, their starter sets didn't go up by the same as everything else, they kept kind of similar. I think they know that they can undersell some miniatures and it might well yield them more returns later. As mentioned though, the core range of Warhammer 40k typically costs a fair bit more, and I thought it could be interesting to look through some infantry tanks and characters. Starting out with a fairly recent, typical Space Marine box set, here we have the Corn Berserkers for the World Eaters, £40, €55 Euros, or $65, US dollars. a little bit more than some of the standard primary space marines, though I guess these guys are seen as at least somewhat elite compared with the rank and file. Maybe not the worst benchmark to go off to compare other kits to. I'd generally say that in the core range of Warhammer 40k, 
the things that might most influence how much a kit costs will be how much plastic you get in the box, with bigger kits and more options generally costing a bit more. The amount of points cost that you get in game for the unit I feel like has an impact. Some very small kits might still go for a lot more, like say characters or super elite units like demon princes perhaps, compared with their peers. There's definitely things that are better or worse for this though. I think that maybe how much the average player might want to pick up of any one kit might vary on price. If they're a kit that you might well want multiples of, they generally tend to go for a bit lower. If they tend to be bigger or more centerpiece things that you only want one of, like say characters or centerpiece vehicles, they might go at a bit of a premium. There's also the recency of the kit to bear in mind as well. Games Workshop does tend to increase the prices of older kits gradually over time, but for the most part they usually don't tend to ever quite catch up with the new stuff that comes out straight away. Kind of makes sense really to have the older stuff that might not have quite as much detail as some of the newer things be a little bit less expensive as it might be a little bit less in demand. Obviously any individual kit from Games Workshop can be more or less valuable by any of those parameters. I think that some of them are definitely just better or worse value full stop, but we'll get onto that in a second. Just for a counterpoint for another fairly recent release, here's a squad of cheaper infantry, Chaos Cultists for £30, €40 Euros or $50. These guys are significantly smaller than the Corn Berserkers, cost less points in game, and have slightly less options and posability as well. But I guess still gets you 10 Warhammer models on the table, and are around about 75% the price of the Berserkers. I think perhaps not too surprising they cost a little bit less, seeing it as they're probably worse on the vast majority of the metrics there. I think that one of the interesting things though, is maybe considering the points per dollar of the unit that you're looking at. As if a player's eventual aim is to get up to a Warhammer collection of a certain size to play in games of say 1000 points or 2000 points, the amount of points per money invested depends on how fast you'll get there and for how much expense. For these two, the Berserkers cost 230 points in game versus 55 points for the Cultists, and after you equate for the price differences, that's around about 3.5 points per dollar for the Corn Berserkers, or 1.1 for the Cultists. Obviously these can change though depending on balance changes and things. My rough assessment in Warhammer 40k is that somewhere around 1 to 2 is fairly bad for 40k, some things are even less than 1, like say the Admech Iron Strider Ballastarius. Generally things with a points per dollar of 3 or more is fairly good by Games Workshop standards, and some of the best discount deals go somewhere in the region of 5 to 9 points per dollar, things like the Leviathan box set and the current Warhammer 40k starter set is in that bracket at the moment. I think that this influences prices to some extent, but obviously not to the point that there can't be enormous variance. I feel like points costs are actually a surprisingly good metric of how excited people are going to be to pick up the models. Bigger and more exciting things that do lots of damage in game tend to have higher points costs, and people are going to be more interested in buying them. Then for another common infantry squad price point, you could look at things like the Blade Guard Veterans. Games Workshop does have really quite a lot of three model small units comprised of some elites for the army. Say for example Aggressors, Inceptors, World Eaters 8 Bound, Botan Brokir Thunderkin, or maybe Sisters Paragon Warsuits even if they're technically vehicles. I'd probably rank a few more elite units like say Retributors, Flayed Ones, or Chaos Havocs into the same sort of thing. These are slightly smaller on individual model size, but maybe sort of feel like you get the same sort of value out of them. In general I feel like while these models are quite exciting to play with in game for the most part, they often tend to be big damage dealers with aggressive weapons or have interesting movement mechanics. In general they often tend to get charged a lot more in terms of per model cost compared with say your rank and file troops, and it's even to the point where even when they cost a fair few points they often still don't have particularly good points per dollar ratios. Say for example the Blade Guard Veteran Squad here, they're 1.7 points per dollar at the moment, and I still consider that kind of bad. Moving on to look at tanks and vehicles, and I'd say that their pricing strategy is kind of similar. The size and recency of the tank are probably the two biggest determinants. Tanks in 40k do seem to have really quite big price differentials between the more recent battle tanks that came out, compared with ones that have been out for over a decade now, and there are quite a few of those. It can often have similar sized tanks for different factions, being a difference of something like £10 or $15 or something. The kits are really quite similar, it's just which ones have been updated more recently. They tend to get charged a lot more for. I feel like Games Workshop maybe also gives a bit of a markdown for transports compared with big things like battle tanks. Often the kits might have at least a fairly similar size and unit profile, but perhaps it's one of the things where they expect that you might want more than one of them. So at least some factions' transports tend to be a bit cheaper than their mainline battle tanks. Say for example, the Impulse is a bit cheaper compared with the Gladiator tank, or the Chaos Rhino is cheaper than the Chaos Predator. 
For typical price points here, the Rhino or Razorback kit is £32.50, just over €42 Euros or $55. One example of an older battle tank might be the Hammerhead gunship, which I think is the same price as a Space Marine Predator tank at the moment, £42.50, €55 Euros or $70, so really quite a big increase there. They do come with some slightly more bulky things on the kit, but it's perhaps just more the addition of an exciting gun, and people being a lot more interested in the battle tanks than the transports for excitement purposes perhaps. They do cost lots more points in game as well, so you might be expected to have less of them. For an example of a newer battle tank, you could look at the Space Marine Gladiator tank, which feels like it's in a similar sort of size and weight class to the Hammerhead tank, but just literally because it's a more recent kit and perhaps because it's got more options, it gets charged really quite a lot more for it. £52, €70, Euros or $90. There's a fair few other things in that sort of price bracket. Other examples might be the Sisters Exorcist or the Admech Scorpius Disintegrator. For bigger things than that, Games Workshop really do seem to be a bit less consistent with the pricing. One example I do find kind of funny is how the Gorkonaut and Morkonaut cost the same price as the Stomper. I feel like it might be partly just because the Stomper is a bit of an older kit, maybe slightly impractically large for normal games of 40k, and Games Workshop always seem to make its rules utterly terrible. But it's still kind of weird to see that a kit that's around about double the size of the Gorkonaut or Morkonaut costing the exact same amount. One of the biggest normal plastic kits that you can get at the moment is the Knight Lancer at £120, €155 or $200. That seems to be the upper end of Warhammer 40k plastic vehicles at the moment. There are some weird variations on a bunch of the things between that, things that you might expect to cost the same not doing so, say for example the Space Room Repulsor versus the Repulsor Executioner, basically the same model but with a slightly bigger turret gun on the Executioner, and that costs around about £12 more. Another area where Games Workshop generally tend to charge more than elsewhere is for a bit of a character tax. The hero sculpts for people's armies tend to be charged at a premium, and these are perhaps the most perplexing to people who are outside the hobby, who might just look at them and not really see them as being hugely different from a normal rank and file trooper, and then wondering how something like this could cost £25 or $40 or something. I guess it probably started with them being charged at a premium due to being made in metal, and that was allowing you to do some better sculpting techniques in days past when plastics weren't quite so good, but often they were prices that people were kind of happy to pay, Given that you maybe have a bit more of an emotional attachment to the characters, they very much feel like prestige centrepieces to the army, and they do cost a fair few more points in game and have powerful abilities, so often for these guys, despite being absolutely tiny amounts of plastic that you get from them, that calculation of points per dollar might not actually be too bad for some of them, though it definitely varies. For their core offerings, they might have minor characters like a Guard Commissar, or the Tower Pathfinder Dark Strider going at £22.50 or $35, these have definitely slowly crept up over the years that I've been playing in the Warhammer 40k. It does feel a bit weird for models like this that you could at least fairly effectively kit bash if you wanted to, even if they might not look quite the same. Standard characters like say this Primaris Captain go for a little bit more, though not quite significantly. £25 or $40 for this guy. An extra few quid for upgrading into a bit more of a chunky space for him profile. Games Workshop seem to keep a special extra tax for special characters out there. It's not absolutely universal, but a lot of named characters tend to command a slight increase in prices even above their standard range. Say for example the Drukhari Lilith Hesperax, the Witch Gladiator cult character, she is £27.50, €35 Euros or $45. And a lot of the time these guys are exactly the same size as the more standard issue. You seem to be literally paying for a named version of the same thing. Finally, I think it's also kind of interesting that bigger units also get the tax as well. That seems to be something that Games Workshop's perhaps emerged a little bit more recently. Say, for example, the Lord Solar is a bigger miniature than the other characters, a slightly chunky cavalry model with a scenic base and a slightly bigger base than most. He's all the way up at £37 or $60, just basically seems to be Games Workshop keeping the same strategy of have one price that you might sell a similarly sized miniature for, and if it happens to be a character, then it costs more than that. I also can't help but think that the inflated cost of characters perhaps was also a bit of a trick to make discount bundles feel a bit better. The vast majority of them tend to come with a character in there, and then people generally see the price that Games Workshop had charged for them and make them look like a better deal. In general, I tend to rate the ones that are very character heavy as perhaps some of the lower value discount box sets they offer, say for example like Combat Patrol Death Watch. Having both an apothecary and a lieutenant does mean that it's just very character heavy.
Definitely even within those categories though, there's a whole load of outliers, things that cost either more or are perhaps surprisingly cheap for what they are. Say for example, Space Marine Hellblasters get you a whole chunk of fairly interesting, fairly elite Space Marines on the board. But other elites like Eradicators perhaps you might be paying almost the same amount, but only for 3 models and far far less points. I do think it's kind of in Games Workshop's interest to keep things that way though. Having a variable range means that you've got again that opportunity for people to get interested and focus on the cheaper kits that get you better value if they want to. But then if you do want to have a more complete collection and have just about every unit in your force available to you, over a longer period of time people can gradually acquire more and more things. Things that might take your fancy at the time and you can just buy individually. I think perhaps the best idea is that they can get a core range that people can start at with an army set say with a combat patrol or one of their starter box sets and then after that as a bit more of a slow and more luxury basis you might say add in a unit of blade guard veterans or a unit of eradicators. That might have looked like a bit more a daunting prospect if you had to make your entire army out of just of those but once you've got a core established then just buying slowly as you want to expand things that seems a bit more doable. I feel like the rule cycle and things getting better or worse gradually over time also feeds into this as well. When a new codex comes out or a new edition drops or they do a new balance check, things might get better or worse. People who have established armies probably don't want to go out and buy a whole new army or something like that, but they might just add in one or two more units that got a lot more interesting, either with some fun rules or points decrease that means they're very good. I don't think many people go out and chase the meta and literally buy out an entirely new army every time things change around a bit, but maybe a few people pick up a thing here or there to keep their army just a little bit more playable against the top dogs. Another trend that I think has been happening in Games Workshop's prices recently is maybe having a bit more of a thought out endpoint for what they imagine say a 2000 point army of each faction to look like on the table and trying to make the rules reflect something that people could actively go out and buy and build towards. I feel like say when they redesigned the game in 8th edition there were all sorts of crazy list builds that maybe they hadn't entirely thought through so well. Say for example orc armies with 18 mech guns were quite good and no one was ever going to go out and buy 18 copies of Games Workshop's ludicrously expensive big gun kit. Certainly people played them but they often tended to either convert them or 3D print alternatives. I think they perhaps realised it's in their interest not to make the official routes to be an absolutely stupid way to get an army together and they do seem to have made a few changes to adjust that in the rules over the course of 9th and 10th. Just for a few examples of that, mech guns for example are no longer 18 model units. In the last couple of editions of the Orc Codex you might want a few of them but probably not to go too heavy. As you might realistically expect an average player to perhaps pick up one or two of those kits over the course of their collection, but might just see the whole endeavour as a bit pointless if they're not going to do anything meaningful unless they have them in huge numbers. Another example, often touted as one of Games Workshop's worst value kits are flayed ones. They come in boxes of 5 and previously you kind of wanted them in blocks of 20 for some builds. Now Games Workshop have rewritten them with a slightly higher points cost and a bit more elite, and only in squads of 5 or 10. Still pricey for the plastic that you get in my opinion, but their in-game rules function better. Gene Stealer Colts that were perhaps infamously expensive got a really good combat patrol box, one that you could get multiple copies of and genuinely build out a collection for a bit cheaper than you would be able to otherwise. It means that overall you still might be spending a fair bit on the army as most of the range outside of that is kind of pricey, but at least you can get the core of the models down for reasonably inexpensively. There's also been things like one model fine cast kits generally going away, things like the Tyranid Biovore, Lictor and Pyrovore have all been replaced by plastics. Certainly the Lictor and Biovore cost a lot more points than they used to in the past as well, so you're less likely to have to pick up multiple of them. And enormous hordes in Warhammer 40k, where you might say you need 200 plus models to have an optimal build, in general they tend to have been really quite rare throughout 9th edition and 10th edition. Often it makes sense to have a horde element of your army with more optimised lists, but in general not to absolutely flood the board with literally as many models as you can fit for the points. Overall I feel like most of this is a sales strategy to add a bit more quality to the armies and make their more overpriced kits be something that you could reasonably pick up as part of a wider collection. So say for example someone just doesn't take a look at the Orc Mech Gun kit, see how much money it cost and how much you might want in your army and then just go and convert them instead. Finally, beyond all the standard plastic kits, I'd also bear in mind that regional price differences are a big factor in where Warhammer might cost where you are. Every so often I do see people turn up in my video comments and say that I've got the conversion wrong between pounds, euros and dollars, and not realise that Games Workshop have their own special way of converting between the three, and that's not particularly linked to the exchange rate in any way. 
at least to my understanding, sometime in the fairly distant past at this point, Games Workshop historically set prices for different regions of the world and how much they were going to charge compared with pound sterling here in the UK, and then never really made any major adjustments since, despite the values of things like pounds, dollars and euros all having fluctuated a fair bit over the years. In particular, the pound getting a lot weaker against the US dollar certainly hasn't helped prices in the USA. Currently over and above the amount that things cost in the UK, euros would usually run at around about 15% extra in terms of price, US dollars around about plus 30%, Australia and New Zealand around about over 40% extra compared with the UK, really quite massively more expensive, and while some of that is made up with shipping costs and Australia sales taxes and things, my understanding is that still doesn't quite account for such a whopping difference between Australia and the UK, they literally just charge a bit more for it, because they always have, and they've just broadly kept things more or less where they were, and haven't really altered the prices much in quite a long time, relatively speaking. Just in general, for Warhammer 40k miniatures, it means that you need to take the prices they might be in one part of the world, say using the UK as a baseline as that's where they're based, and then they'll cost more depending on where you are in the world for the most part. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of musing as to Warhammer 40k prices and why things are the way they are. I think it's really quite a layered question when you get into it, why are they so expensive in the first place, and why can Games Workshop afford to charge so much for them? Plus all the subtleties of why any one plastic kit might be significantly better or worse value than each other's, varying for all sorts of reasons, including model size, points in game, how recently they made them, and just perhaps by design having some things being better or worse deals than others. Certainly a fair bit of speculation in this one, I certainly don't know what goes on behind the scenes at Games Workshop, though I'm more than happy to hear any other insights that you might have down in the comments. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention as well that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page, and that's what allows me to keep on making Warhammer 40k videos like this quite so regularly. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.